lot of slides and not a lot of time. So we're going to fly through it, but then we have some time afterwards for um, answering questions and to chat. So we'll be presenting the Heights. It's a 85 suite mixed use six story project in Vancouver at 388 Skina Street. It was our very first completed passive house project. And we really have to thank 8th Avenue Development and Peep Construction for um, going that step with us, going passive and reaching past the minimum code requirements. And we are also currently working on another passive house project with um, 8th Avenue. And this project was built under the city's rental 100 policy that allows higher density for projects as an incentive to provide much needed rental housing. The project was um, completed in February, 2018. And it was a pretty big deal. The mayor came to the opening ceremony. Um, at the same time as the Heights, we were working on Spire Landing. It's a 95 unit passive house project um, designed to the same principles, um, was spearheaded by, spearheaded by Simon Richards from our office, also falls under the rental 100 policy and was built by Spire Developments. Um, outline of the project. So I will quickly walk through the first points and then Scott will talk about monitoring actual energy performance. Um, the Heights only was recently certified as Passive House Classic by Passive House Academy. These are the stats. Um, the frequency of overheating based on the PHP pH is shown here at 0%, which unfortunately is not true. And probably the issue of overheating is one of the biggest lessons learned for us on this one. Um, the basic building envelope um, is probably more effective than um, required. And this is because we were chasing primary energy the whole time. Trying to keep this one under 120 was our biggest challenge. Um, we probably would have looked at lower so solar heating glazing, um, for example, if this would have not been the main issue. This is a typical section showing the elevator and exiting structures, extending the thermal envelope into the parkade. Um, and then this is a design pH image um, of the same problem, the ground floor connection to the parkade plus code requirements such as auto openers and um, uh, closure ratings made this area quite tr tricky in terms of thermal bridge free design. Um, these are some interior shots. The project is very dense. 72% of the units are one bedroom and studio apartments. And when we look at the um, annual heating uh, energy balance, balance graph from the PHPP, you can see that the internal heat gains are huge, which is um, probably because of the density of the project. And it was uh, interesting for us to see that the thermal bridges um, didn't have a big impact at all on the project. So um, really the um, the uh, comfort and health became more important than the energy performance. And then retrospectively, the, the thermal bridges of the parkade probably was, were not the biggest concern. Envelope details. Um, we looked at different approaches, exterior insulation with rock sole um, and EPS and the interior insulated version. We then went with the interior insulated wall um, is fairly conventionally framed with conventional siding insulation, which helped us with detailings and um, the area could be finished up inside in dry conditions. There were some sequencing issues. Um, Peak built um, full, full scale mockups of, of the walls, which were, we had them in the office first, then we hauled them to site and they were huge, um, hugely important and became a good reference point for everyone. We did a woofy analysis of the wall. You can see some movement, but all within the, um, within the range. Um, then for the sequencing of the wall, First, we framed the exterior two by six wall. We put the air barrier on top, built the floor, wrapped the air barrier around the floor and joist. Then we framed the next level on top of the overlap, uh, put the moisture barrier on, in this case, the Siga My Vest. Um, and then um, we installed the, um, so we ex insula insulated the exterior wall with that. We installed the quick therm, which is two inches with the EPS with a polymer face that became our air barrier, taped the MyVest to it, taped the window frames to it, installed the interior service cavity wall, insulated that with that as well. So this is the um, same thing in progress. So you can see the moisture barrier and the air barrier wrapped around the floor ends. Um, then here is the taped air barrier. Um, the trades took great care in fixing all the little nicks that happened, but the project product was actually tested with some polymer missing and it still performed fine. The Euroline Thermoplast was the only locally made passive house certified window at that time. 
Um, so we used this one and we added some solo so like heat paint glazing on the west facade. Um, we opted for the install on the outside face, um, which is conventional for trades here and in line with the outboard moisture barrier. Um, when you look at the firm model, the install is not ideal. The isomers are quite bent, but Vancouver is um, quite mild, but very wet. So um, this install was worth the energy use penalty for us. This is a corner unit facing southwest. You can barely see the Soho low solar heating um, coating on the glass. Um, but this is another thing that Passive House became great for us because it's located at a very busy street, so noise is not an issue with an envelope like this. This is the commercial space. We used the same windows for the glazing here, um, installed the cream wooden post. EPS on the slab, um, extending four feet up columns and walls to deal with thermal bridges here. This is the same section, highlighting thermal bridges, mostly related to concrete. Um, to ensure continuous air barrier, we kept the inside walls off the exterior walls so we can install the air barrier continuously and have easy access for taping and sealing. Um, this is the um, floor junction where you can see in the detail the air barrier wrapped around the joy stands and, and the therm performs quite well. This is the slab edge junction. Um, we notched the slab so we can install the guardrails on that level thermally broken and we had some uh, extra insulation on the outside of that slab edge there. Um, this is a conc cold concrete slab and a planter where we shifted the planter wall outside to add extra EPS and insulation on top of the slab. Uh, we were looking at isocorps but then opted for insulation on top and bottom instead. This is a uh, balcony deck transition with extra insulation on top. Um, we installed sunshades on the south side of the building, fastened to the rim joist, probably could have chosen a bit more dense profile. Um, and then we have here on the left, steel canopy installed with a wood as thermal breaker. In the middle is the elevator shaft at the elevator lobby floor where we kept a gap and insulated that to try and keep that uh, connection as minimal as possible. And on the right side, you see uh, the commercial area with the EPS on top of the concrete, but we did forget about the formwork that then got embedded in the EPS and became thermal bridges. Um, air tightness testing, we achieved 0.29 air changes per hour, which was very exciting. Probably the biggest issue were the um, parquet doors, which had to be rated and we couldn't source Good doors, so we just ended up using standard pocket doors. Um, building systems, elevator, we used the Coney Eco Space, uh, efficient motors, low standby energy consumption. Um, we insulated the inside of the elevator shaft with rock wall and we kept all components thermally broken with um, four inches of wood blocking. For ventilation, we looked at four different ideas but then went with a semi central system. We used 19 as uh, Zenda. Comfort Air 550s, located them on level six. And then each of those HRVs vertically serves a stack of up to five suites with fire dampers on each floor lane. This allowed us to keep the runs to the exterior quite short and um, easy access for building management to access the HRVs for maintenance and changing filters, et cetera, without the residents having to access anything. Um, that was earlier fire damper and HRV. Um, this is now the in-suite air distribution um, for hot water. We used um, gas. There was just not much else there at that time. For newer projects, um, we are using the sand and sea two by steel pumps that are much more efficient. Um, plumbing vents can cause significant loss. Can cause significant losses. Um, we overlooked that in the beginning, so we ended up wrapping them with insulation in a panic in the end. Um, for appliances, we are using um, efficient appliances such as heat pump type dryers and recirculating hood fans, which took a little bit of convincing with the municipalities, but then were approved in the end. And now, um, Scott and the monitoring. Everybody hear me fine, I assume. Uh... So what we did is we did do some monitoring of the building. We had various monitors put in it. We were fortunate to get a little bit of, not enough data, but enough to at least help us understand what was going on. So we looked at the indoor humidity in the building and it seemed to be very well kept. The gray line is the outdoor temperatures in Vancouver, outdoor humidity in Vancouver and the uh, other lines are individual suites, north, south and west, typically suites. Uh, and it seemed to be very good that way. 
We also looked at indoor CO2. The red line represents a thousand parts per million. You can see generally the suites are really kept in a zone between 500 and 700 quite, quite, quite the well. And uh, we get the odd occasional one, but that's a party or something going on, I assume. We looked at, because we had the sheathing on the outside of the building and uh, Vancouver has this tradition of leaky condo problems based on too much moisture on the sheathing line. We did monitor the moisture on the sheathing line and we did find that it's, uh, you know, it, it stayed well within the parameters. It just briefly went out of the parameters every once in a while, but nothing that we were concerned about at the, at the time. But we also, we did a split insulation on the roof. So we have some of the insulation above and some of the insulation in the cavity in order to take advantage of the cavity. And we again measured the, uh, the, the moisture content on the plywood at that interface. Uh, which was not what you would think is ideal under the building code, but we did some whoopy analysis and felt it would perform well, and uh, the monitoring proves that it does. You got to remember that a roof is open to the north for the the winter, you know, cold sky, which is much much colder, and but it seemed to be performing quite well. We also monitored a bit of shrinkage in the building because it's a six-story building. It's uh, fairly early parts of the time doing these things, and we looked at the shrinkage. We did find that the exterior walls didn't shrink as much as the interior walls. So we saw a little bit of shortening on those interior walls relative to the exterior walls. This is the, really the issue that we face with this building is that it is a hot building. It tends to be much warmer than we thought. We believe, uh, well, as we go through it, we think it's mostly to do with internal heat gains are much higher than what is assumed in a PHPP. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, but we did have this is a this is a July month, so it, it did get quite hot and occasionally went up as we go. And sometimes even in the winter, it tended to overheat. And this was kind of a, a tally of the suites that we monitored and then how often they were overheating in terms of you know we're supposed to be 10%. So one suite on the north met it, but even some of the north suites were overheating. So if that can't be solar heat gains, that has to be internal heat gains. So that's something that we learned on this building and uh, something that we felt is, uh, is something important lesson to take forward in what we do from now on in. In July, we found that, uh, again, some of the suites were quite badly overheating, even the north. So you can see that uh, that is, that is a, an issue that we're trying to deal with in the building. And we were on a busy street, so we wanted to see just how often we were gonna have to change the filters. And uh, so, some something in the order of three months, these filters got pretty dirty. So we had to come up with a slightly more uh, rigorous changing of filters on the building. Uh, we find that even oftentimes in colder days, there are a lot of windows open in the building on the south face. And that's all part of the operation of the building that we have to think a little bit about as we move through working these buildings. And the other piece is we really hadn't even been talking about climate change at the time we did this. And we realized that a lot of the data, the climate data that we use is actually old data. It's not new data. And I know there's been lots of discussion and I know there are tools coming in the PHPP to help us rethink some of those things for this, particularly this overheating event that we need to think about. So these are a few of the conclusions that overheating was an issue. CO2 seemed to be fine. Uh, relative humidity seemed to be fine. And the way this HRV system works, it's interesting. Uh, it's each of those five suites uh, is on one HRV, but the suites all have a button in the kitchen and a button in the in the bathroom. Where if you put it, the HRV will speed up for all five suites for about 20 minutes, and that seems to have been a very good strategy. And it seems to have worked quite well in this building. And it's one that we're contemplating doing on a very small project that we're working on right now. So now let's look at the energy performance of the building. So I managed to get from our utility power company, the actual energy consumption of the whole building. Uh, and now this includes the parkade. So it's not uh, a PHPP related energy, but this is includes the parkade. And this is kind of the profile of the energy use in the building. And you'll see that it's actually fairly flat and you don't get all that big a peak in the winter months. And that's telling you that we have a passive house and it's working wonderfully. So this is the uh, this is the heating estimate of where the energy is going in the building as it is. 
you can see that the gas consumption, which is solely the hot water in the building, is a very big chunk of the energy. But what was really surprising to us was that the electrical energy between the common areas and what was actually in the suites was about 50-50. And we really felt that the common area electricity seems to be much higher than we would have expected. Part of that is because we're not using much energy for heat in the suites. And part of that is, I think, we need to also be looking at these parkades and these other facilities in the building that are outside the PHPP when we think about energy consumption in these. And so that's something that we're gonna to try to refine as we move forward, uh, but we're happy to do passive house buildings. One thing I did do is I looked at if we replace the gas heating with the sandins, what would happen to that equation? And you can see that by using a sand and heat pump or any kind of a heat pump, that that hot water generation becomes a much, much smaller portion of the total energy consumption of the building. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is what we estimate the heating energy for the building to have been. And you can see that it's very, very close to the PHPP. That being said, we have some internal heat gains that are obviously aiding that, but I also think we have some opening windows even in the winter that are probably penalizing that. So I think that, uh, you know, that we know that passive house works, there's clear proof that it's, it's really a great way to go in a cold climate like we have here, a heating dominated climate. So the other piece that we were looking at was the plug loads that were actually going on in the suites. And I was able to extract these because I had the total energy consumption for the building and I had the bills from the owner of the building for what he was paying for the common area meters. And when I subtracted the two, this is what I got. So the PHPP was telling me, you know, we would use about around 100,000 kilowatt hours and we ended up using closer to 230,000 kilowatt hours. That is something that I think is significant. That is going to turn into internal heat gains in the building. And I think we need to be analyzing these buildings for that as we move through thinking about these things. Now we have another building, which is a certified passive house up in the, actually it's up in Smithers, which is about 20 minutes from where we're doing that with Suetton building. And uh, if you saw Monty's picture, when we did that air tightness envelope, that was Monty sitting in this building doing the air tightness test. Uh, what we did find out, because we were able to get data of individual suite meters on that, is these are all pretty much the same suite. And you can see how much different there is from one studio to the next. One's using 135, one's using 36, one's using 17, one's using 45. It's amazing how much variation there is that's really related to occupant behavior. And again, that's going to affect what's going on inside your building. And my friend Lynn, who's on the call here today, has always talked about uh, when people live in a passive house or a building that's supposedly a green building, they kind of maybe get a little lazy there and think, well, the building's doing it for me. My, my behavior doesn't have to help. And maybe that's not true when we think about lights and other such energy. And uh, that's just something that's a reality. And we got to think about these things as we design buildings. So this was something again that we looked at in the building was the actual gas consumption. Now this is related to um, hot water use primarily. And this is kind of what we ended up with uh, in the PHPP versus what we actually found in the building. And again, when you're putting this much extra hot water in the building, you're going to contribute to overheating of the building. So this is something that we worked out a little bit. Uh, we don't actually, unfortunately we don't measure actual how much hot water is flowing in the building. So I relied on an engineer who came up with a, a little formula. He said, well, it's probably around 50 liters per person per day, which quite honestly is about double what is modeled in the PHPP. Now we don't have full data on that. And we're hoping to build a building that we will get better data on that sometime in the future here. Well, actually it's coming up pretty quick. So the one thing I did look at was, hey, if we change the gas hot water heaters to our heat pump hot water heaters, what would happen to the kilowatt hours per square meter per, you know, per year, which is part of the past bus? So you can see it's a major difference when you're using, when you convert to something that's about three and a half times as efficient from something that's probably running about 90% efficient. Uh, and so this is an important thing as we move on to electrifying our buildings. That being said, if we did convert it to fan and heat pumps or something similar, it would still cost our developer a couple thousand dollars a month more to operate. And thus the $170 uh, carbon tax 
which would level that playing field out for sure. So that's something that I think is going to be very useful as we work through. So here in BC, we have a thing called the step code. And the step code has an ultimate total energy use intensity of 100 kilowatt hours per square meter per year in our highest step. So I, again, looked at the building and I said, well, as it's performing right now, it's about 117. Um, but if we change the heat pump hot water, it would be 87. But if we add cooling back in, it's going to be a little bit higher. So I think these are important things we have to think about. Um, I know there are other savings in this building, which we're bringing into some of our other buildings, particularly in the Park 8 part. Uh, but these are this is a tough target to meet. TEU of 100 is going to be very hard to hit. Um, so this is a building literally a block away that we're uh, tendering. I think the drawings go out tomorrow for tender. But at any rate, this building, we have a bit of a grant to do some monitoring in. Um, and uh, we're going to be working with RDH and with Integral to actually get some better data on the building. And we took a few lessons. So one of the things we've done in this building is we actually are going to be putting operable blinds on the south face of this building so that we can cut those solar heat gains down quite considerably. And we're still playing around with what uh, what actual coating on the window we're going to use is in conjunction with that. Second thing is we're putting a central ventilation system in. We're, we're, not, we're using uh, two large units in this building, one for the north, one for the south. Uh, and we're putting a central cooling coil. It's cooling and heating coil on those units uh, using heat pump technology, which will uh, reduce, which will really help mostly in the summer in terms of trying to uh, keep those uh, temperatures down if those internal heat gains are as high as what we think. The third thing we're doing, uh, we're going to a Colmac heat pump on this one, and our engineers are actually using the Colmacs. Uh, they have fans in them, and they're actually going to use the fans that run these Colmac heat pumps to actually also provide the ventilation in the parkade. So the idea is to share the energy of the fans to do two jobs, to ventilate the parkade and to generate uh, the hot water for the building. And so this last slide are all the passive house projects we're working on right now, or are uh, a couple of them are built or a couple of them are under construction. Uh, and I know we have five or six more coming and we're very happy to share this with you. Thank you very much.